Good afternoon, everyone. First off, I wanted to uh, let you know that my name is Rick Jewell, and I am an executive assistant with the Aurora Mental Health Center. I will be acting as the moderator for today's webinar. This is our third webinar in this series, and um, we love having the external audience. I just have to say that I'm a novice at this Zoom experience and sharing screens, so I do apologize if there are any glitches or technical difficulties that should arise throughout the course of the webinar. I have muted and stopped the video feed for all participants in order for all to focus on the presenter, as well as to protect the individual privacy, your individual privacy. This webinar is being recorded and will be utilized for both the Aurora Chamber of Commerce and the Aurora Mental Health Center's internal and external audiences in order to continue supporting our community during this challenging time. To further protect your individual privacy, each of you have the ability to click on the three dots on the upper right hand of your individual screens. And then you can rename yourself or even just put a simple dot, dot, dot in place of your name. When we get to the Q&A section during the last 10 to 20 minutes of today's webinar, please direct all questions to me, Rick Jewell, via the chat privately, and I will, um, I will state the question to the presenter and all. This will promote uh, more privacy as to who is asking the question. If you so choose um, to keep your name visible, that is fine as well. And if you wish me to unmute your audio so that you can ask the question directly, please state so in your private message to me that you send. The chat feature is found at the bottom right of your Zoom screen, and it will open up a chat feature box to the right. It automatically defaults to an everyone in the dropdown, so feel free to change the everyone in the dropdown to say Rick Jewell in order to send the chat questions to me privately. You may send me your questions throughout the presentation, however, they will not be asked until the Q&A time at the end of the webinar. And at this point in time, I would like to turn it over to today's webinar presenter, uh, Dr. Dawn O'Neill. Welcome, Dawn. Hello. Hello, and I'm gonna pull up your PowerPoint as we speak. Great, thank you. You are welcome. Let's Alrighty. See. There we are. Perfect, so today's topic, depression. Um, recognizing the signs, coping with the uh, things that you have a hand. Can you get the next slide, please? I sure can. So first thing I wanted to point out as we get started is that it's okay to not be okay. And I think that can be one of the hard things about depression and stigma is that sense of what's wrong with me, I should be doing better. And we need to allow ourselves to acknowledge, hey, I'm having a hard time here. Um, so we're in the midst of this global crisis. This is a hard situation. And just to acknowledge and validate yourself, because that's going to be one step forward towards being able to do something to help yourself with your depression. So recognizing our problems starts with being willing to recognize that we're vulnerable. Because um, I think there can be this big temptation to just tough it out. And once you recognize the signs, then recovery is possible, help is available. Okay, so just to kind of normalize this, is, and this is even you know, obviously a stat here from when we're not in this global crisis, according to the CDC, it's estimated that 8.1% of adults over 20 had depression between 2013 and 2016. This is not an unusual event to struggle with depression and just that, can be helpful is to know you're not alone. So signs of depression. Um, you may be finding little interest or pleasure in doing things. Things don't seem fun anymore. Uh, feeling down, quote the blues. Sleep disruption is a sign. If you have trouble falling asleep and it could be too much sleep or it could be even just having uh, disrupted sleep, not staying asleep. Uh, things to notice would be changes in your appetite. If it's decreased or increased, that could be a sign of depression. Uh, feeling bad about yourself, uh, guilt and negative judgments. And I think the negative judgments is something you in particular want to be careful about 
again, it can be tempting because uh, especially with social media, even now during this uh, global crisis, people will try to post um, maybe a more positive image of themselves than is going on in the fuller picture. And then it's, it can be tempting to pull into this negative judgment about what's wrong with me and to really set aside those judgments. Difficulty concentrating or making decisions can be a sign of depression and then having low energy. Uh, maybe you're staying in bed too long. Uh, maybe you feel like you're just moving slowly through the world, getting up off the couch is hard. That would be a sign that some depression might be going on. Um, anxiety, on the flip side of uh, having that low energy, you might feel like there's a restless energy, moving about your home and not having a real purpose and just feeling restless. Increased physical symptoms. And then recurrent thoughts about death, thoughts about hurting yourself, thoughts about suicide. These would all be signs that point to depression. Causes of depression. Um, so let's say you notice it, um, you acknowledge that there's a depression that you're experiencing. It can be real tempting to get caught up in that sense of why. And that's linked to the uh, risk of negative judgments. Why me? What's wrong with me? Um, just this real vicious cycle of why um, is it going on? And sometimes there's an identifiable trigger. Um, it might be just the reaction to the COVID-19 crisis. It could be a death or a loss, interpersonal problem, maybe an anniversary date, but sometimes the cause can't be pinpointed. Sometimes the depression just happens and it may be down the road when you're feeling better that you get a sense of, oh, now I can understand why that happened, but sometimes it's there and you can't quite put your finger on what's going on. And it can be helpful if you find the why, but not to get caught up in negative judgments if you can't. And you can still work on recovery even without the sense of a why. So next slide, please. So it, what we do know is that depression is a complex illness. There's many factors. I mentioned some before that could be some situational environmental factors. Uh, biological factors play a role. For example, research has shown that when um, we look at people who are depressed, they have an increase in their cortisol levels. Um, a lot of research has pointed to a variety of different areas in the brain thought to be involved in depression. There's some really fascinating stuff going on with trying to map out, you know, if we can even get more sophisticated in terms of which brain region might connect to different types of depression symptoms. There's a lot of research in that area. Next, please. Um, depression sometimes runs in families, and that's a suggestion for genetic factor. And there, again, there's a lot of research looking at what kind of genes, and it's thought that there's probably multiple genes involved in the depression process. But again, even if you don't know what is causing your depression, you can still be helped. And that's the thing to really focus on. All right, so coping with depression. It is definitely important to pay attention to your self-care. Um, Exercise is important. So I talked a little bit about what goes on with brain chemistry. And what we do know with exercise is you get those really good endorphins going, which enhance mood. Um, the idea would be three to five times a week for 30 minutes. Um, and, and the nice thing, I mean, we're kind of on the cusp of yes, we're in shelter in place. Different communities are going to be starting to look at what type of relaxation might be going on, but even with shelter in place, you can still exercise, you can take your walks, ride your bike, um, and do some exercise. And so it's important to really keep that in your schedule. Uh, important to avoid drugs or alcohol, because we do know that that manipulates mood. It can be tempting to go down that path when there's depression and stress, because sometimes what people are craving is that temporary bump in the mood but then you get the downside, um, which is usually a bit more uh, detrimental to the mood in the long run. So you wanna be careful about that. And then prioritizing sleep and stabilizing your sleep and healthy eating. And again, I think that's one of the dilemmas people are struggling with right now when they're home so much. It can be tempting to fall into a pattern of just kind of picking at things with the food. And you wanna really coach yourself um, to look at those healthy eating habits. 
continued on self-care. Take time for positive, enjoyable activities. Put that in your structure, put that in your day. Um, this could be anything. Um, scented lotion, warm baths, showers, candles. Um, just taking time to notice the signs of spring. It's starting to get a little bit pretty and perky out there. Sun's out a little bit more often, trees are budding. So even just noticing visually something that's very pleasant, taking a nice deep breath of the smells of spring can be a way to pull that positive into your activities. You can uh, use music. Um, you wanna be careful with music. Music has a very powerful mood enhancer, but you wanna be aware of when you pick a selection of mood, uh, music, what is it actually doing to my mood? Um, and, and try something. Because if you're craving energy, I'm mentioning here, you might pick something soothing, but you might want to be careful if it's too low key. If you um, want energy, you might want a little bit more pep in your music choice. Um, if you're feeling that restless energy, you might, might want something that's a bit more relaxing. So that I think one of the keys with music as a coping skill is to be mindful of um, how is this really impacting me and is this the right choice for what I'm trying to accomplish with my mood. Okay, next one, please. Be gentle with yourself. Really, really want to stress, I've mentioned this before, don't judge yourself for how you feel. Be kind to yourself. Um, this, is a, this is a tough time and it's gonna take some time, some practice with coping with the depression during this environmental crisis. One of the things you can do, and there's a lot of research to prove that this work, plus it's a very pleasant activity, is practice a daily gratitude um, and you can do this through journaling, um, create a gratitude jar. Sometimes I've worked with people, you get this pretty piece of pottery, maybe a glass vase you have in your house. And just in the every day, write down something you're grateful for and put it in the jar and just wait till you fill up the jar with all your gratitudes. That can be a nice way to bring positives in, um, something that you can appreciate. Next, please. Okay, connecting to others. So depression can be isolating um, and it can make it hard to connect. And this isn't just about, wow, I'm stuck at home while we're doing the shelter in place. It might be, wow, I don't even wanna leave my bedroom and there's other people who are living in my home with me and I'm not even connecting with them. It might be the people I texted regularly, I'm not texting. Um, the depression, again, so that low energy part, there might be a guilt part or a shame part in terms of those negative judgments. So it's really important to be aware of, hey, what's going on? And to notice this, because sometimes I can just sort of slip away and you might not even notice that you've started to pull back from the people around you. Um, one of the ways to deal with this is to make a deliberate plan for your activity. Uh, pick something that might be motivating and in your environment to help encourage that activity and then try to build in an activity with that motivational element. So it might be if you walk the dog, don't walk the dog alone, walk the dog with somebody in your house. It might be if there's a show you enjoy, um, invite someone in your house to watch it with you or text a friend, ask them if they're gonna watch the show, make a plan, you'll both watch the show and then you'll text about it. So if you can pull in something that's gonna help motivate um, that connection moment, that can help. You can ask others that you trust to help you make a commitment to connect. Um, what we do know is if you put it into a commitment, don't leave it to chance, it's gonna help with a follow through. So when you're connecting with a friend, ask them to help you. Say, hey, I'm you know, noticing I'm not as social as I used to be. And if you make a commitment, okay, tomorrow we'll talk at seven or tomorrow we'll both go out and do the howling at eight o'clock and then we'll talk about it. Um, that can help with that commitment to be more connected and social. Next, please. Wait, hang on, sorry. That's okay. There we go. <laughs> All righty. And then just acknowledge again, I think I can't say enough that it's important you validate yourself. This is hard. Um, depression is hard when we aren't in a system that contributes to isolation, but just validate yourself if you're struggling. So you try to make this connection happen and it just doesn't work for you. Um, don't beat up on yourself, acknowledge this is hard. The COVID-19 is definitely making us in a more isolated position. 
and we just have to keep trying. Um, going back to what to do when you're in your home, again, we're for those who are working from remote, um, we're off our usual schedules. Um, take time to make sure that the family meals are family meals, that you're not just all drifting in and out of the kitchen grabbing stuff, which can be tempting to do. Um, and then when you have the meals, again, set aside your distractions. All right, um, and then finding a sense of community. Um, sometimes that can mean changing your cultural norms. What does it mean? The things that we used to do. So like when I go to the park now, I don't go near people, um, which is very different in terms of sense of community. So we're doing things differently. Um, I don't know if anybody who's listening has gone out and done the howling at 8 p.m. I would encourage you if you haven't done it yet to go do it. And it's a, a different way, obviously, of community, but you hear the other people and you know you're not alone. And that's a big factor is like, wow, I'm part of something. I'm part of this community, part of my neighborhood. I'm connected. And again, it's not the same as connecting face to face and going to a movie together, but it's a connection. So we're looking at what's different in our community, what's different in our world about how I can make that connection happen. Um, waving at your neighbors across the street. Again, a different way of connecting. Uh, my neighbors just had a baby and I've seen the baby from a distance when they're outside in their yard. But I haven't gone over there, which normally I would have done, of course. But we've shouted at each other, we've waved at each other. And again, it's a different way and I know I'm connected. Um, and I know that they know me and I know them. It's just different. So it's different ways of connecting. Next, please. Oops. I have done the howling, by the way, and it really does lift. Oh, yeah, it's it fun. <laughs> Absolutely. So just a big plug for that. Yep. Okay, and then, of course, there's technology. Um, FaceTime, Google Hangout, um, video-based options like what we're doing today. Um, lean into the technology and have fun with it. Don't think of this as something, I mean, maybe you're already tech savvy. Before all this, I was not tech savvy. Um, but I've been having fun with it. So just jump right in and try something fun and different. Um, I mix up my background quite a bit. I put it to create the mood I want, put it to create the idea I want. Just have fun with these new ways of connecting. Um, and then do fun things online, classes, meetup, book clubs. Next, please. Um, ask others how they creatively connect um, using new sy systems and different ways of interacting. Um, this is a time when you can bring in your playful side. Um, and if you're struggling with depression and your sense of humor isn't pulling in, have other friends bring it in and help you with that because that can be a way to help your connection as well as your depression is to ask them to bring something playful into this element that you're doing. Um, plan meetings that you might have otherwise done in person and don't worry about failing. So anything you can try taking a walk together using technology, cooking together, um, gardening together, set your camera up, point it at you while you're in the garden and they're in their garden, just different ways and try it. Don't be afraid of failure. Next please. And then of course there's treatment and I think it's really important again to remember you are not alone and help is available and treatment works. Because again that low energy part of depression and sometimes that guilt that what's wrong with me can have us pulling back and not reaching out for the help that would or could be available and then we're more isolated so remember you're not alone um, and it's okay to ask for help and what we do know is that a combination of psychotherapy and medication has been found to be very helpful next please okay and so therapy therapy provides the opportunity to get support for what you are experiencing sometimes it's helpful what, what we do find is just to talk it through so because some people will say well what good is talking it doesn't change anything i'm still depressed but again you're connecting with a person you're not alone which is really important um, you might even find yourself connecting with a group because right now even while therapists are doing things from remote groups are happening you may even find a group where you can share with other people not just the therapist so it helps you to know you're not alone. It helps you to talk things through. It helps you to get a different perspective. Um, it can also help you problem solve ways to expand your support work network, try out new recovery skills. So I'm just throwing out different ideas, 
But when you're in therapy, the therapist can help you select the idea that's right for you, that fits in your world and in your lifestyle. So it's a lot of problem solving. And again, it helps you know you're not alone. Next, please. Um, there's a lot of types of therapy. And so I bring this up because um, when you start with a therapist, it's okay to ask them, hey, what's your approach? What's your style of therapy? And see if it's the style that resonates with you. There's no one way to do this. Uh, cognitive behavior therapy is one kind of therapy. And that helps with changing, um, identifying and changing our thoughts and behaviors that contribute to our mood problems. Just even looking at some of these ideas and tailoring them to what's going to work in your life. Um, and then it can also problem solve some of the interpersonal things going on in your life and that, how that impacts your mood. So those are some of the different types of therapy, um, but there's a lot of different ways to do this. Sorry. Yep, no, go ahead. Okay. Okay, and then of course there's the medication component. So medication can be very helpful with depression. It increases your energy, it can improve your sleep and it can improve your mood. And all of those are three very important things because sometimes what happens with depression, so again, going back to the idea of low energy, is you don't have the energy to do these coping skills. And so when you talk with a doctor, you may end up with an antidepressant that's focused on giving you more of that energy. And then that energy leads to your greater ability to use your coping skills. So that is one of the components, even outside of the idea that it is, of course, going to focus on improving your mood. It's going to improve your energy, more able, more likely to have that ability to kick in those coping skills. And then, of course, improving your sleep, because if you're not sleeping, it's going to be hard again to do some of these things we're talking about. So there's uh, a lot of reasons. These are just a few reasons why medication can help. Um, your, your primary care doctor can sometimes provide an antidepressant. You might also, depending on how complex it is, what you're dealing with, want to consult a psychiatrist who can help with that antidepressant. Um, it's important to be patient with medications. One of the frustrations that I know our doctors at Aurora Mental Health Center sometimes hear is it takes a while. So a lot of these medications take a while to work. So it's gonna require a little bit of patience and not to give up on it, not to think, oh, well, what the heck, I've tried it for a week and it hasn't worked for me. You need to go longer with that and keep in touch with your doctor and your prescriber. And sometimes that's the hard part is to be a little bit of patient. Um, the other hard part with medications is sometimes the first medication that's tried isn't the one that works. And that's not unusual. And it requires more patient. And again, you just need to meet with your doctor and say, okay, for whatever reason, this first one we tried, it's not working. Let's um, talk about a different one. So I really encourage you, if you find that you want to seek out a consult on medication, to approach it with an open mind. Just be prepared to be a little bit patient as you and your doctor sort out what's going to be the right fit for you. Next one, please. I'm on it. <laughs> okay. Multitasking. <laughs> okay. Oh, did it go? Is it? Here didn't go yet. Okay. How do you know when to seek professional help? Okay. I think at any point in time that you feel that it's right for you, you should go. And it's not like, oh, there's this magic sign that it's time to go step in and time to go get help. But, um, if you think therapy would benefit you, I think it's okay and just reach out for that. Um, some things in particular that might mean it's time to reach out is if you're more irritable, you're snapping at others. So in addition to the signs I've already mentioned, if things are starting to go in the wrong direction with your relationships, um, definitely a sign that really you should look at reaching out for that professional help. If you're too overwhelmed, isolating too much, you notice, wow, you know, I haven't gotten out of my pajamas in a week. I haven't texted my best friend in days and days and days. It's kind of a sign that really you should look at reaching out for some help. And you need to be aware that resources are available. And again, you're not alone. Next, please. And so when to seek professional help? So Aurora Mental Health Center has telehealth remote services. So this time is the right time as much as any time else. Um, so you can just uh, call that um, if you want at 303-617-2300 and get some information on what we have offering for mental health and substance use concerns. 
Um, we've got doctors by telehealth, we've got therapists, like I mentioned earlier, groups by telehealth. We even have some of our social and rec groups happening by telehealth. So you can call that line. Um, we also have a support line option when you call in if it's about just talking and sharing and getting support and resources. Um, and then you have the Colorado Crisis Services, which is listed down below, and they have a text option as well, which can be nice. Um, younger people sometimes like that better, or even if it's hard to take that first step, you can definitely take that first step by texting. One thing, Dawn, if I may, yes. uh, about our support line with Aurora Mental Health Center is that it's from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. Um, seven days a week is my understanding, correct? Yes, yes, so I should have put that eight. in there. It is on weekends as well as weekdays. Thank you. You're welcome. Oops. And I think that is it. <laughs> no more slides, right? No more slides. Okay. Then I'd like to open it up. I don't have any um, questions in the queue right now, but if anybody would like to ask a question of Dawn or have any um, comments or something, please go ahead and send that to me privately via Rick Jewell or, um, and let me know if you want to unmute your microphone or whatever. At this time, I'm also gonna go ahead and unmute um, Dee Dee Poole, who is with the um, chamber and see if she has any comments or anything. There you are, Dee Dee. I got gotcha. you. <clears throat> Thank you, Rick. Thank You're you welcome. so much, Dr. O'Neill. That was a, another amazing presentation. Um, before we uh, leave, if you can possibly put up on the screen there, Rick, how everybody can contact Aurora Mental Health. And um, sure. is there, do you guys uh, specifically accept certain insurances for um, to speak with a counselor, or how does that work? Can you so speak a little bit? We can take um, most private insurances, um, definitely Medicare and Medicaid. Um, so we have a pretty wide range of what we can do and what we can take. And if somebody doesn't have insurance, um, how does that work? We can handle that. We have, um, frequently we have grant funding. Um, we have funds from OBH. We have a sliding scale. So depending on whether or not it fits with a grant, that might cover it. Whether or not it fits with some of the OBH funding. Um, but then there is also the sliding fee. So regardless of whether they have insurance or if they're not able to pay, there's still some kind of way that they can get help, right? Absolutely. Okay. And um, this is completely confidential for anybody? Therapy is confidential. I mean, there are the limits, of course, if there was to be a, a suicidal or a risk to other concern, then we would need to address that. But therapy is a confidential service. Okay, perfect. And as you all can see, there's the toll-free number and the local number right there for you to contact. Is there another way to contact after 8 p.m. or is that the toll-free number? So that is the number that goes to 8 p.m. If somebody were calling our detox, I believe that goes later, but I did not put up the detox number. You can we call the main our... number and it'll give you prompts, I think. Yes. To, through to detox. So this main number, Dee Dee, the 617-2300, you can certainly reach anyone on our live support line from eight to eight. Outside okay. of that, there are additional prompts to get people to see um, the walk-in center and to detox, mm -hmm. my understanding. The yep. 800, the 844 number is the state's Colorado Crisis Services number. Okay. Um, so that's not necessarily yeah. ours, it's for the state. Yes. So. And I did have one more question, I'm sorry. Do, do you guys also offer some types of uh, group sessions? So say for instance, uh, if somebody is suffering from how to deal with a loss of a child or somebody else is suffering from something else like an, i know some places have group therapy do you guys have anything yeah. like that? yes we um specifically do have a grief and loss group um although it's not specific it can be any type of grief and loss we have um cognitive behavior therapy groups we have anger management groups we have emotion regulation groups we have a pretty diverse range of groups 
Okay. Um, they are going by Zoom right now. Yeah, I think, and I'm, obviously I'm not a professional on this, but I feel like if somebody might have already been dealing with some other underlying issues, that um, going through this situation may just enhance um, mm -hmm. any other kind of, you know, uh, things that they might have been dealing with. So that's good to know that you you offer that type because, yes. you know, the COVID-19 experience that we're all facing may just be the cherry on the top. Whereas, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and we try to have a diverse range just so people can address all the different components that are going into their mood issues. Right. That's wonderful. Thank you, Dr. O'Neill. Sure. So may I ask a logistics question real quick, um, Don? Yeah. To be a part of those groups, do you have to be opened to individual therapy or opened yourself or, the, or the, can they be drop-in groups? So um, we had, when we had um, on-site services, we did have drop-in options where you didn't have to be open. But right now to join a group, you have to be open. And that's, a lot of that is just because during the process of getting open, all the rules of confidentiality, how to conduct yourself in a group, how to respect the confidentiality of other members in the group are addressed. Okay. And we just um, strongly support that those are necessary elements to enter a group because people are sharing vulnerable material. Absolutely. So it's pretty easy to get open. Um, it is um, not mandated um, for some people that they have to do individual therapy if they strictly want to do a group. We do have people who prefer groups, but we do want people to be open just so we can make sure everybody's on board with those important components of being in a group. Absolutely, thank you for that clarification. I appreciate that. Sure. Um, at this point, you're you're offering uh, telehealth, right? We are. Mm -hmm. Yes. And and all of our we have telehealth for all of our range of services: um, families, groups, individuals, doctors, meds, everything. That's wonderful. I actually, uh, kudos to you guys. I saw you guys featured on uh, Channel 7 this morning. Ah. Thank you. That's yep, awesome. Thank you. We have a question in the chat there. Or do we? Oh, no, that was from you, Rick. That was from me. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. I, you know, I, I have to say as a somebody who's in the, you know, works in the mental health center, some of the things that you just went through, um, Dawn, were pretty i mean they hit close to home in terms of you know realizing well you know i am kind of restless and i'm just kind of wandering around the house going now what do i do but then really just checking in with myself but then checking in with other people even you as a colleague of mine or something it's important to do so uh, to, to just not poo poo those little things mm -hmm. and realize that they could be leaning to something something bigger that i need to look at so i really appreciate this Rick, I think I got a question that came just to me. I'm not an expert on chat, but it says it's to me. Okay. Um, so if it's okay with you, shall I go ahead and address that? Agree. Yes, go ahead and... Um... Okay. So the question had a connection to self-harming behaviors and uh, the way it's phrased, not necessarily um, suicidal, because sometimes there are self-harming without that suicidal intent. And I think some of the best resources for that is to get into therapy and there's a specific type of therapy that targets that. So self-harming can be a way of destructively mood regulating. So what we will uh, frequently do when a person comes in and that's one of the symptoms they're presenting with is connect them with an individual treatment approach or, and or a group treatment approach that focuses on those mood regulation skills that are specific to breaking up that cycle of a, a destructive mood regulation and moving the skills over into a more constructive um, mood regulation pattern. Um, so that I would definitely recommend into therapy, but have that identified to the therapist as the kind of therapy you need. Wonderful, thank you. Any other questions that someone wants to direct towards me, Rick Jewell, or to Don O'Neill? Okay, I'll take that as a no <laughs> for the moment. Um, <laughs> Dee Dee, any, any last thoughts from you or anyone um, from the chamber? The last thing I would like to mention to everybody, first of all, thank you all for joining us uh, today and for your support on this.
webinar. Uh, the um, Aurora Mental Health will have another webinar next Friday, which is May 1st, if you could believe it. Wow. Uh, <laughs> I know. Yeah, it's amazing. That's amazing. So that topic is going to be trauma and COVID-19. And part of the discussion is going to be um, uh, talking about tr direct traumatic impacts of COVID-19. And part of me, uh, you know, some things that Dr. O'Neill touched on today that, like Rick mentioned, we don't even notice that it's happening because it's just happening so fast um, that we don't even realize the impact that it's having until you can maybe sit back and, and think about it. I know I, I, I went to, I told the story in a couple other presentations that we did. We were going to Sam's and to get gas and I saw people coming out of Sam's with toilet paper and paper towels. And I immediately was like, oh my God, drop me off. I gotta go get some, even <laughs> yep. And then I found myself like starting to walk faster and faster, almost to like a slight run to the back where I knew the toilet paper and paper towels were to hurry up and get there before they were all gone. And then I just felt that anxiety building and building and building. And when I got home, my husband said to me, are you okay? I'm like, I'm fine. He's like, no, really, you're not. Like ever since we came, <laughs> you're acting very strange. And I didn't even realize right. how that small thing of getting toilet paper and paper towels, which at this point to me seems insane, um, <laughs> yeah. you know, affected me. So talking about that, um, mm -hmm. next week's presentation, we're also going to talk about uh, the current crisis, uh, how it's evoking adaptive trauma responses for people that actually have histories of traumatic experiences. Um, so kind of reliving those things that are coming up again. Mm -hmm. And then also considering implications of the current crisis for those ongoing traumatic situations. They're going to talk to us about how we can encounter the effects of physical distancing, uh, supporting an internal sense of agency, and safety for ourselves and others, and how to mitigate potential traumatic impacts. So that's going to be by Kate Dunn, who is a licensed clinical social worker there at Aurora Mental Health, and she's also licensed uh, addictions counselor. So look for that. And before Friday, we have a uh, Zoom webinar Monday through Thursday every day. Between they're, they're, they vary between uh, twelve o'clock, one o'clock. One of them actually starts at eleven thirty. Um, some talk about meditation. We're going to be focusing a lot on um, the business aspects, how we're going to reintegrate back into everything. Actually, the webinar that we're doing on Tuesday at 12 o'clock with uh, Rob DeLang, we're going to have three uh, panelists on there who are um, specialists in resume writing. They actually have worked with human resources through many different organizations. So they're telling us, come prepared with your resumes um, so that you can talk face to face with, uh, with the experts that can help you to get that together. And then you can even collaborate with them after. So just go on our schedule and see the different uh, meetings that we have scheduled for that. But that's it for me. Rosalind says, thanks Dee and guests for all the great content. Um, and we thank you all for your time. Dr. O'Neill, again, thank you for all the great information. Sure. Rick, an amazing host, as <laughs> always. Oh, thank you. Yeah, yeah, if anybody else has any other comments or questions, please feel free to let us know. If not, then I'll just let Dr. O'Neill and, and Rick uh, give their final wrap ups. Okay. All right. So on behalf of Aurora Mental Health Center, I just wanna say thank you all for letting us participate and continuing to foster this relationship with the Aurora Chamber of Commerce and with all of you valued listeners and watchers and um thank you so much for your time and we'll see you next week yep thank you very much have a good Bye -bye. weekend